So, hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk here. We're going to try to build together a joystick, actually, a more of a sort of a gamepad for, for games, of course. But let's start with some introductions. So, who you are? My name is uh, Filippo. Oh, do forward. And I work for a, uh, for a company named Jam.gg, which basically uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go deeper into, into that. And I'm also the author of Limiroid, which is a popular Android uh, emulator, retro games emulator. And, and I'm know. Reno. I'm a freelancer, worked with Filippo last year, and I'm part of the Android user group as well. OK. So we can move a bit of our prologue, try to explain a little bit the context of, of this talk here. So Jam is a company that's basically a game streaming technology provider. So basically, it's a SaaS uh, model when we take um, retro games or modern games, we make them run into the cloud, and we send to devices, actually, in the video stream and the audio stream. And you can actually play those uh, uh, games on your, on your devices. Those devices are, generally speaking, uh, web devices, but we also support uh, mobile platforms, and specifically both Android and iOS via Compose multi-platform. So this is the context. And uh, when I actually joined Jam, Renault mm. was, uh, was uh, working there. So I'll, I'll leave the stage metaphorically to him since we're together, but yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and we will uh, talk about what you were doing there. All right. Oh, sorry. No, I forgot a piece. This is important. Ah, yeah. So the, um, the tricky part of doing uh, this work is basically that we need to support a lot of different devices. So you can imagine a lot of different um, retro games uh, and consoles. They have a, their own device, their own uh, controllers, their number of uh, keys, every shape or form, even the, the strangest one. And we needed to support basically them all. So we need to come up with a solution that was scalable enough uh, to work on every uh, different device, basically. So let's now go back. All right. So before going more into the implementation details of how Joystick, I uh, would like to give you a small reminder on the technical tools that are at our disposal. Uh, all right. It's the second day of Android Makers. I'm, si I'm sure you have, been, you have seen a lot of great talks about Jetpack Compose already. So let's just do a quick reminder so we are all on the same page. Jetpack Compose actually comes with different, uh, with a gesture API to handle touch and inputs. So bear in mind that it's different from animations. Uh, this is used under the hood uh, when, for example, a user presses a button or when a user navigates to another screen using a keyboard, external keyboard or the IME or just basically when the user enter his email address with the software keyboard. The gesture API can be split into three main chapters, the focus, the interaction, and the pointer inputs. Today, we are not going to focus on the focus and uh, the interactions, but mostly on the pointer inputs. Let's deep dive a bit in the pointer input. So Compose provides a variety of APIs that help us to detect the gestures that are generated from the user interaction. So this API covers a wide range of use cases. Regarding the pointer input, we can consider the following hierarchy from the upper to lower level. So we have components that use built-in gesture handling of components. Most of the time, it's great to use them for accessibility because they handle the accessibility for your user as well. We have the gesture modifiers. So it had the gesture handling and some extra functionalities. The gesture recognizer, we're going to see that a bit uh, later, that detects full gesture inside a pointer input modifier. And of course, we have the pointer events that handle row pointers events using the pointer input modifier. We would recommend you to watch this amazing talk of uh, Yolanda Verhoff about the touch and input if you want to go deeper. Uh, but today, we're going to, in terms of creating our own joystick, just two important functions. First, understand that a pointer is a physical object you can use to interact with your application. So in our case, in a joystick, it's a thumb. Um, the function creates here pointer input a modifier 
for processing pointer inputs within the region of the modified element. Uh, we usually use it with the await pointer event scope to create a coroutine scope that can be used to wait for pointer inputs. Now we, can, we have to understand that a gesture is a sequence of pointer events that can be interpreted as a single action. So we have this gesture detector that waits for pointer down and touch slope in any direction and then calls the undrag callback for each drag event. In this example, we have four callbacks on drag start, on drag end, when it's cancelled, and of course on drag. All right, now comes the moment that we start building our joystick. So before Phil joined me on this mission uh, last year, I must admit that I had no idea on how to build this. So I decided to build something that just worked and then try to improve it, which is the name of this chapter, the bad idea. So basically, my requirement was we want to navigate through a list thanks to a joystick. A simple joystick or D-pad was just the goal at the beginning. So you can see a background here and a dot moving. Uh, before starting to code, uh, you know there is this moment where you are supposed to take a piece of paper on the pen on, uh, on your brain to consider what you like to do. Uh, well, I usually like to think in terms of functional programming, and I think it works pretty well with Kotlin and Jetpack Compose. Why? Because the input in this case is a thumb, uh, the user thumb has a pointer input with coordinates x and y. And the output is actually two things. Are we in the press? Are we in the release state? And what is the direction asked by the user? So for the pointer here, we have a, a, um, a row left, up, right, down, and then we can split. Finally, it's as simple as that. Uh, we have the on value change callback. You might notice something here. The background size and the dot size, which we will rename foreground afterwards, uh, are actually param parameters. But actually, designing a joystick is not the kind of component that requires to be considered as responsive design. Why? Because the human thumb uh, won't change based on the form factor of the app you are using. Uh, uh, the app that it installs off. For example, in a tablet, you won't have a, a bigger joystick. Uh, so this is a component that has a fixed size, and it has to be like this. And we will see later that it, it, it comes with benefits. So my first idea was, oh, this is a circle. Uh, are we in a Cartesian coordinate system in two dimensions with x and y? Yes. So why not just bound the x and the y coordinates, and according to the position, we can just send a nav key. So in this case, uh, the xy, it's fine. I can see that it's upper right. OK, still fine on the left. OK, now the player is not looking at the joystick because he's focused on the list. And since it's not a physical device, uh, sometimes his thumb is outside of the box. And uh, at, at this list, it's out of the burning. So what happened here is it's not working. Why? Again, the solution was very fast to implement, but, and it actually worked. But in terms of user experience, it's horrible. The user has to be concentrated all the time to not go out of boundaries. So how to improve that? No matter, no matter where the user thumb, if it's in the press state, how can we keep updated the nav key? with the press and release date. So now it's the five minutes of uh, mathematics. Don't worry, it's uh, middle school uh, mathematics, but we are going to speak about trigonometry in this case. Let's find together the three functions that we will need to use for the improved version of this joystick. How to calculate an angle, how to find the direction from this angle, and how to properly apply an offset for the dot. OK, let's take the problem we had before. We are out of bounds, so we are using the x and y coordinates. We know that it's not the best. Let's create a rectangular triangle that can be extracted outside of this circle. And you might notice there is a theta angle. So 
it's actually a simple rule. Um, you get the tangent theta, and then you get theta from r tangent of y divided by x. So write let's write this in Kotlin. This angle, it has to be positive for counterclockwise direction, known as in the tri trigonometric direction, for the upper half plane, when y is positive. And it also has to be negative in the other part, so basically when y is negative. Second rule, let's plot the circle and the point with the polar coordinates. So let's do some divisions. From the angle theta, it's way easier to bound on now the nav key. Basically, when theta is between 0 and pi divided by 6, we know that we are in this corner. So we can provide the nav key. But how about the offset when the thumb is out of boundaries? So w there is one definition. It's the only one mathematic definition you will have uh, for this. Um, it's in mathematics, the polar coordinate system, it is a two-dimensional coordinate system which point on a plane is determined by a distance from the reference point and the angle, theta in our case, from a reference direction. And we can easily switch from the x and the y from the Cartesian to the polar system with theta and the radius. And we have these two functions to do that. Um, so basically, we can have a method and we extract with the cosinus and the sinus from the x and the y and the radius and the theta we previously calculated when we are offset. Okay, so now we have all the tools we needed, so let's improve a bit the heuristic. Um, we have the background, we have what we call the dot at that time, but now we call the foreground. Uh, so basically we put a box and an image, so not very important here. We're going to have the local density, we're going to have the center, of course, uh, because this y, the zero, 0, is in the upper left corner of the device, it's not right in the center, so regarding to my calculation I've showed you, we had to make some adjustment, of course. So let's create the center, and then we offset the content by the offset of in pixel, that can be positive, but as well as non-positive. Applying an offset only change the position of the content without interfering the size measurement of this component. So this modifier is perfect because it's designed to be used for offsets that change possibility due to the user interaction. It avoids recomposition when the offset is changing, and it also adds a graphic layer that prevents unnecessary redrawing of the context when the offset is changing. We put in the remember the nav key, the nav state, with our state here. And then we start with the detect drag gesture. So on drag start, we have the state press. And now we go on the drag. So on the drag, basically we fail fast. If it's not pressed, then we don't care. Then we consume the pointer input. And then what we're going to do, we apply the offset with the center because upper right corner, upper left corner of the zero, zero. We get theta, we create the get theta, then we get the four dimension, and basically that's it. If it's the new position, then we update, otherwise we don't update. You can see there is a vibrate here. Phil is going to speak more about the haptic feedback that are very important, because when we change direction, since it's not physical device, we have to provide the user feedback so he knows that something happened. All right, with this, the dot does not move. Uh, why? Because we didn't apply the offset, so we create this polar to Cartesian, and then we can go way out of bounds. <laughs> so that's great, but not so bad. And then the idea is, okay, this is a fixed size, the thumb is a fixed size, so we can actually bound with the max radius. So in this example, I think the foreground was 60 dp, so let's bound that to 30 dp. And then we have to update, of course, the offset within the offset modifier. How about the drag hand? The drag hand, very simple. We just reset everything. So we are sure that when the user press again, it's going to update. So with that, we have, uh, can I start uh, this video? Yeah.
So with that, we have just a simple, if the network works, yes. We have a simple joystick with the bound library. So that was the better idea. We have a joystick. We saw a bad idea, a better idea, but to go further and bring the best gaming experience, we had to think a bit more about what could be a best idea. Okay, so we're very happy, and we actually have already a, a joypad which you can actually use to move your character around. But the idea here is actually to think a little bit bigger than that. So how do we perform action? We need something more, we need more controls, and not just uh, one, one piece of the, of the puzzle. So the idea was actually to start thinking how to integrate all the different uh, controls. And uh, it already raises a little bit of problems because some controls have actually a different behavior. Let's take a look on the left side. I don't know if you can see it, but probably you can. There's my finger moving uh, on the screen. And uh, as the finger moves, we still want it to be dragged by the D-pad, by the cross that we have there. And for, this, for the very reason that we're not explained before. You're not looking at the gamepad, you're just moving around, and you still need to uh, provide that input. On the right side, things change, because on the right side, maybe you just want to very quickly press on something and then go back to your action. So this uh, drag action should not actually stay on the touch control where uh, the drag started, but we want it to translate to move to the other control. To do so, I mean, it's very hard to do that with the Drag API because we are handling um, different, uh, different controls. So what we decided to do is to take it down a notch and go to the pointer uh, input API, which allows us to have raw pointers. The other issue is that some of these pointers are actually going to move among different controls. So in order to do that, we decided to have a single big compose function outside, basically, that is going to handle all the touch events and we we'll try to find a way to dispatch them to the proper controls. And uh, in order to do so, we also decided to use a single input state so that the gamepad itself will have just an input state and it will not be spread among all the different uh, controls that actually make up the, the gamepad. So what do we mean with single gamepad state? It's basically an immutable class that uh, is cons consists of a set of digital keys, which are going to be like Boolean uh, properties, like a button is pressed or is not pressed. That's it. And then we have a set of directions. So the, the analog that we know explained before is probably going to be mapped in a direction which is made of an offset, which has an X and a Y component. The data structure is immutable. As we can see here, the set digital key is going to create a copy of the input state and the same thing for the set direction. So we're always going to create new copies of this object using the immutable um, data structures. About the single input handling, we're going to have a single uh, compose function that's going to take all of the pointers. And this is going to try to make sense of it, but we don't want to put all the logic inside this. So we created this idea of a handler, which is basically going to be an object that handles the touch events only for that specific control. And um, so basically we take all of the inputs and we send them to a specific handler. When do we decide uh, when to send it to a handler? Either the finger is tracked by that handler and uh, it covers the case that we're showing before, you know, so you are moving your finger out of the analog bounds and you're still sending the events to the analog. And the other one is the, the pointer is actually on top of that control. And uh, each of these handler is going to take the current state, update it, and we're going to call all of these handlers. So the, the, basically the data structures that we're looking at are going to be the pointer, which is a subset of what we get from the compose uh, pointer input library. So basically an ID which specify which finger physically you, you have on the screen, and the position, which is just the offset. The result is going to be a new input state and possibly a new drag gesture, which will allow a single, con a single handler to say, hey, I'm interested in, in where this finger goes, so please forward all the next uh, uh, pointers to me. And the handle function is simply going to be a function that takes uh, a bunch of pointers, an input state, the current one, and the current drag gesture, and it's going to create the result. 
So let, now suppose that we implemented this. Let, let's pretend it for a second. And uh, let's ask ourselves. We are in the big compose function, the one that handles all the events. What can we do to actually dispatch the events to the right handler? Well, we take all the changes that we have there. We filter out for the one that are actually on screen, so the press one. We don't care about releases at the moment. And uh, we map them to the pointer offsetting for the position of the gamepad, which we you know can change because the user rotates the screen or whatever. Um, and then, basically, we call a group by. So the outcome of this is going to be a mapping between each handler and all the pointers which are interesting for that handler. And we add this pointer if either is tracked by the handler or if it's on top of it. Now, uh, we created this map, this association, what we needed. We are now going to update all the states. So we're going to uh, basically take the handler's association. We're going to map uh, the pointer to actually the relative position inside that specific handler. And we're going to call the handle method. And notice that we're doing this inside the fold uh, method. So basically, we're going to apply one after the other all the changes of the single handler and then we reduce the input to the final uh, input state. So this will be actually the real input state. And we also set the drag and gesture if one of these handles actually requires a uh, drag and gesture. OK, we cheated a, li a little bit. Like, so we said, uh, let's suppose we do have this handler. Where are they? We decided to use actually a custom scope. So the gamepad is going to have a separate scope. And inside this scope, we're going to declare uh, the input state, and uh, all our handlers in a map so that if they changed, if they change for whatever reason, there is a recomposition and we it's placed differently, we are not going to keep handling, uh, keep adding those handlers. And we also create a register handler method, which actually those control can actually call to, uh, know, to actually notify the, the gamepad that they are adding their own handler. The controls at this point are going to be set inside uh, as an extension function to the gempad scope, as we can see there. So they are actually able to access all the items that are declared inside the, uh, the scope, and specifically the register handler function. This is the control analog that is going to have a bunch of stuff, which we'll see later. But most importantly, when it's placed in, uh, in our own, uh, um, own composed um, hierarchy, we're going to register and pass the analog handler with a unique ID for that specific item. Let's go back to the, to the joystick. Mm. So we really like that, uh, but for gamepads, we sometimes need different uh, kinds of joystick. So what we decided to do is actually split, as in physical or real gamepad, D-pad or crosses from analogs. And they both have advantages and disadvantages. So the D-pad is generally very quick to change direction, very good for platforming, like very fast-paced games. But the analog is more precise, more accurate, has a bunch more values, uh, has basically an infinite number of values, while the other one has uh, eight, uh, counting for the, for the diagonals. So let's now, we have a framework. We decided how to implement this framework. How can we actually implement both of these uh, controls using that framework. Let's start with the analog. The analog is going to have its own analog handler, and the analog handler is going to have the handle method that we showed before, which takes, again, a bunch of pointers, input state, drag and gesture. What we ask ourselves is, we are currently mm, detecting a gesture, so let's try to find the updated position for that gesture. And we set the value to the current drag gesture. Then we ask ourselves, is there any pointer? If there's no pointer, it means that no one is actually using this control. So we simply say, OK, we update the state to say that this control, the ID is referred to this control, is going to be unspecified. And it will be up to the UI to draw that. Um, if instead we do have an updated gesture, so actually the, we, we are dragging our fingers somewhere, and we know where that somewhere is, we compute the difference compared to where we started, and then we return that value. This is basically what the uh, Android Drag API uh, gesture does, but we do it uh, uh, on our own. And um, if there's no uh, dragging gesture, we simply take the first finger that we have there, 
uh, on, the, on, the, on the handler and say, okay, let's track this one. So we return an offset of zero because it's the starting position, and we pass the first pointer as, uh, please, forward me all the other events uh, with this specific ID. On top of this, there's actually the analog control, so the proper uh, compose function, which is basically the one we saw before, but uh, fully, fully qualified this time. So um, there is a modifier, there's an ID, there are background and foreground, as Orna was mentioned, which are set by default. And as we can see, the foreground is actually uh, taking a Boolean, which is, am I pressed at this time or not? So the UI can actually draw it differently depending on the state. And uh, inside, there's a bunch of scaffolding to, to draw stuff. And you can also see, again, the globally positioned um, call to actually set the handler specifically for that. And, um, and that's it. It can access, as you can see, the input state. Why? Because that's still in the, jump, in the gamepad scope that we, uh, that we defined before. So it can actually access that. But the foreground and background uh, compose function cannot. So we need to actually extract that. We don't want to, uh, this scope to bleed uh, too much. So all of these are declared as internal to that scope. But we pass actually those pieces to the function that you can actually uh, change their, uh, their UI accordingly. What about the D-pad? Well, it's roughly the same thing. The biggest difference is that this one has just eight values that we have. Um, and uh, the handler looks very similar. So again, we try to see, hey, is there the finger that I'm tracking among the pointers? Um, if there's no pointers, then it's not used, unspecified, don't care about tracking. If it's actually, um, if it's there, this time we find the closest state. So basically we compute the distance between all the eight points that we specified in this uh, cross handling and take the closest one and we say, this is the current state. And also I'm interested in uh, keep um, monitoring this, uh, this pointer. And uh, if instead we don't have anything, then we just take the first pointer and we'll keep track of that. Um, so let's move again one step above that. We have the cross control. Again, nothing too different compared to, to the analog. As you can see, we still have the own global position. We still have the foreground, which actually takes a, a, a Boolean. That, no, this time takes an offset because it's a cross. So you can map all the different uh, positions for that cross. You can, I don't know, tilt it or change it, whatever, <laughs> however you, uh, you prefer. Um, but basically, the, the gist is still the same. All good. Now we have two controls to actually move our characters, move on the menu, all that stuff. Where's the meat? Where can you actually perform some actions such as shooting, jumping, running? We need to implement face buttons. And face buttons are a mess for the very reason you see there. Every gamepad has a different number of face buttons uh, shaped uh, in a very strange way, arranged in an even stranger way. So, it's complicated to, uh, to fit all of this. What we decided to do to have something that allow us to keep our sanity somehow is to basically use a circle packing algorithm. So we have a big circle and we try to pack inside smaller face buttons there and, um, and then we, we try to, to match that. It's a bit mm -hmm. of disconnecting, but it's fine anyway, okay. Um, so basically, we just specify the number of circles we want to have inside, and a Boolean parameter, which is going to tell, I also want the middle one or not, which is the difference, for example, for the, uh, for the fourth picture compared to the other one. Now, to do that is rather not complicated, actually. Uh, there's a small formula that tells you how big can the uh, circle inside uh, be compared to the, um, to the bigger one. And, and that's, and that's uh, given there. And what we, did, what we did is basically, you do know the number of points you wanna put, so you just put them at a constant, sweeping at a constant angle. So in this example, we just had four. So you compute the radius of the uh, smaller circle, of the circle inside, and then you just move of 90 degree each time. And if you wanna change it, it's, uh, it's trivial to, to move it to, to other numbers. Um, another very important aspect are the composite buttons. So 
um, one issue that we have is that on a real physical device, you can press multiple uh, buttons with your thumb, because your thumb is big enough. So in this example here, you want to jump and use the whip when you are on top. But you can't raise your finger from the jump button because you will lose momentum. So it's a little bit messy to, to handle that. So what we, what we decided to do is to have these composite buttons, which are basically small buttons in between that are triggered only when you are on top of those, which means that you can either tri uh, trigger a single button uh, or both of them, depending on where you place your finger. It takes a little bit of time to get adjusted to the new strange button in the middle, but after a while it gets uh, comfortable enough. And um, another big topic were actually haptics. So you have your, you have your uh, mobile device, uh, you don't, you're not looking at it, and you can't understand if something is triggered or not. The reason is that you don't feel the keys under your finger. So what we decided to do is to use haptics to force your brain into perceiving that something has happened. And uh, it's very easy to do that because we have the full gamepad state. So we can actually ask ourselves, this was the previous gamepad state, this is a new gamepad state, what happened? Ooh, uh, two new buttons have been pressed, so I will perform the press uh, haptic feedback, or one button has been released, so I will perform that. Um, and to actually implement it, we used, uh, you probably have seen it like multiple times in these two days, but the actual expect uh, mechanism. So basically, we created an haptic effect, which is going to be either press or release, and an haptic generator, which takes one of these haptic effects and actually performs the vibration. And we had an expect function to actually remember the haptic generator. And we decided to use that uh, for, uh, okay, let's go back to the iOS haptics. So this is the iOS implementation. Um, Why? Hmm? If there is someone from JetBrains, uh, we are just waiting for them to bind the haptic feedback. Yeah, I, I'm sure it will happen. Uh, <laughs> well, updates are very regular, so <laughs> this will happen. For the time being, you have this bunch of code uh, that you need to keep in your, in your, in your, uh, in your project. Um, and the haptic generator uh, for Android, which actually has the uh, application context. And to get the application context, you can actually leverage the fact that all starts from this remember haptic generator function, which actually has access to local composition, so context. And you can actually do this and uh, um, have a single haptic generator that you can actually uh, call. So all of this was nice. Let's take a look at it uh, all together. So this is actually you, how you define a gamepad layout. So you have this big compose function that we mentioned. We call it jampad in this instance. And this one creates a jampad scope inside. And the jampad scope can actually uh, contain the control cross, the control face button, the control uh, analog that we displayed before. You can position them easily using standard um, Jetpack Compose layouts. And uh, you can also specify IDs. So for example, the control cross is uh, ID zero in this example, which means that you can read its state by looking at the input state and say, get direction zero. It will tell you where that uh, where the control actually is. Same for the face buttons, which are very easy to, to use, as you can see. So you just pass the IDs, and then you, um, those IDs, you will find them in the, input, uh, in the input state. Where's the input state? We have actually uh, a callback there, the on input state updated, which you can actually register. So at, at that, in that uh, clause, you can basically put uh, you get a new instance to the input state, and you can serialize it, uh, send it to view mod, whatever you want to do, basically. Um, there's your, your callback. And I think that's it. So we, we wrapped up this, uh, this library. We thought it was nice, and we also decided to, to share it with you. So we released it as an open source project. Um, you can find the source code there. We even put the, the QR code. Um, one quick disclaimer. This is very, very early stages, so we released it yesterday uh, at midnight, something like that. So there might be some <laughs> issues and there might be some optimization needed, but it's still working, so uh, any contribution or feedback is definitely um, appreciated. So, uh, yeah, that's the, the project itself. Mm. And uh, 
probably how how bold are we? We're good. Uh, can I sum a bit one thing? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Phil and I we're from Android Phil, uh, both of us, and of course uh, we were asked to do an iOS app for this. So a feedback from this is how great is the gesture API in Compose multi-platform? So at the beginning it was this, and now it is uh, like this. And so far we are very happy uh, because the gesture API is very well bound with iOS. So I'm not going to have this React Native or Flutter speech like multi-platform is great, but in our case, uh, as you have seen, there is multiple kind of use cases and also UI related uh, as you have seen and we share the same code base uh, from iOS and Android and it works well except the haptic feedback. Uh, so far no bugs. So that was a very good thing. Uh, they keep improving the iOS thing. Uh, it was a little bit slow at some time but now it's very good. So that's kind of a wrap up for this. Uh, what we wanted to tell you is, uh, of course, we have a demo. So I'm going to start this just to know that it's Fields playing, it's not me, uh, because I'm not as good as him uh, for this game. So in this case, uh, you can see it's cloud gaming behind, so it's a modern game, it works on an Android device. And there is this layer on top with the arrow, uh, on the left and the uh, control buttons. Uh, so your get player. Yeah, as you can see, the, the UI is a little bit different because we have that uh, foreground and background way to, uh, to actually change the UI. So this is, uh, I mean, as, we, as Uno was mentioning, this is the, the very same library that, uh, that we have been developing and, uh, and it's used here. You're, you're very good. No, not, I mean, I played this, this uh, mm -hmm. many, many for times. Queuing, so for of queuing, that's, that's for queuing. That's <laughs> Make sure that it works uh, great. And uh, maybe we can do this. Let's check this. So we have another one. Very similar to this one, but more embarrassing. Ah, yeah, it has to be so... Yeah. If it detects, mm -hmm. my cable is a bit uh, USB. Great. Uh, where are you? We lost the screen, so that's actually yeah. It's on. ah no, it's full screen. That's why. Sorry. It should be better like this. Wait, sorry for the resolution. Um, so this is the another mod. So this is Phil playing. Uh, this is for, for for real right now. Yeah. So if uh, any of you uh, would like to share us feedback about the gaming experience or do our QA. You are more than welcome uh, to come to speak to us. And uh, you try to beat Phil as well on some games. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but that's it for us. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, if you have questions. Project. Is there any questions?